Okay, let me introduce our two speakers, and I will be very short and therefore somewhat unfair to them, as I want to get on to hearing them and not having you hear me. So, Lewis Hyman is Associate Professor of History, and as of this fall, Director of the Institute for Workplace Studies, Industrial and Labor Relations, Cornell University, which moves him from Ithaca to New York City. Um, he went to Columbia, where he got his BA, a Harvard PhD, and he's a fellow Baltimorean by birth. He's the author of the well-reviewed and popular books, Borrow, The American Way of Debt, and Debtor Nation, The History of America in Red Ink. Certain theme there. <laughs> but he is now completing Temp, The Deep History of the Gig Economy, as well as co-authoring a book with me, I'm happy to say, tentatively entitled Supply Sided. He is one of the leaders among a group who are re revising and revisiting the history of US capitalism with a nuanced perspective of the particularities of how businesses and finance have developed in this country and with what impacts on the social structure and inequality. Natasha Skander is Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Wagner School at NYU. She has a Stanford BA and a, a MIT PhD. She spent part of her, of her youth in Cairo, where her aunt Lila, winner of the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize, involved her in helping garbage workers learn recycling techniques. So she's had a very amazing youth that has led to some very amazing work and perspectives on work. Natasha is an expert on migration and its relationships to jobs and the dignity of work, not just to the work and the contracts, but also the dignity of work. Her first book, Creative State, 40 Years of Migration and Development Policy in Morocco and Mexico, as well as the one she is currently completing on immigrant contract laborers who work in the construction industry in Qatar, not only deepen our understanding of the role of, immigra of immigrants in international labor and development, they also make us rethink the common conception of what it means to be skilled. A lot of people who we look at and think they're unskilled actually encompass, embody, very important skills that deserve our respect, and um, Natasha is helping us to see this. Both have been actively engaged in the CASPIS project on the future of work and workers. There are several others here who are also engaged. I, I see Catherine and Margaret, you're here, and Maureen, are you here? I saw you earlier, and Phyllis, I thought I saw you. Okay, have I forgotten somebody? Probably. Good. Oh, Tino. You're here, who helped us start the project. Um, and both contributed fantastic essays, as did several others in the room, to the CASP series on that subject in Pacific Standard. Maria Straczynski, who's here, who's now at Mother Jones, helped us get that started. So I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this, what promises to be a great talk. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out to CASBIS tonight to join us in this conversation about what are probably the two happiest subjects you can probably imagine, uh, the future of work and climate catastrophe, just to keep it on an up note. <laughs> now, when we think about the future of work, it struck Natasha and me that perhaps many of us are worried about the uber economy. You know, this is what we see dominating the pages uh, and dominating the conversations, especially outside of Silicon Valley. But we think perhaps that the future of taxis in the climate of climate catastrophe might be just a little bit narrow. <laughs> that, in fact, taxi drivers are important, it's an important conversation, but it's not the whole conversation. In fact, it's a small part of perhaps an even broader conversation about robots and how robots are all supposedly going to take our jobs. Now, we like talking about technology, it's fun, Maybe even like talking about technology and work. Climate change is harder. Climate change strikes us as something that is more difficult to get a grasp on, to get our heads around, and find a location where we can really make change. 
And yet, when we think about the future, we think about the rise of robots, we should also be thinking about the rise of the oceans. In fact, we will argue tonight that you can't think about one without thinking about the other. That to think about climate change without considering the future of the economy, without considering the future of work, is blind to the possibilities and importance of both. Now, like I said, it can be a little daunting to consider climate change, automation, and migrant popula populations all at the same time. But this is what we're going to face in the 21st century. And so Natasha and I began a conversation, a thought experiment. I'm a historian. She's a sociologist, among many other things. And we started talking about, well, what could we do, and what's a good analogy, perhaps, to think through these different issues of climate change, automation, and migrant populations. And we began to think about the 1930s. We began to think about the crises, the multiple crises of the 1930s, especially the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. Now, climate change today is not as visible as the Dust Bowl, but we still need to act. And in the words of FDR, we must act, we must act quickly. Now, what are the similarities between these two moments? The 1930s uh, experienced this Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Now, naively, if you sort of eke back in your head back to high school history, you'll remember the Dust Bowl had a lot of dust. <laughs> it was an ecological crisis, an ecological catastrophe. And the Great Depression had something to do with money. They actually both had roots in the same things in the stock market speculation, in the urban mortgage speculation, and the farm mortgage speculations of the 1920s. They converged into an economic and ecological crisis stemming from this relationship with the land that was primarily financial in, uh, in uh, practice. Now, the New Deal had lots of ways to handle the economic. It's a long list of very long words there that you don't need to read, I promise you. And then, for the ecological solutions, they planted kudzu. <laughs> they planted some trees that rapidly died. And in fact, our economic imagination was stronger, more vital, more creative than anything we did with the ecology. So as we think through these issues, we want to ask the deep question, why have we forgotten so much about the economic solutions of the New Deal, which put our economy on a brand new footing in the post-war, and why is it so much harder to imagine ecological solutions in tandem with the economy. Now, one of the things we learned as we wrote this talk together is that we disagree, which we think is at the essence of how we need to approach these problems. We need collaborative disagreement, which was also part of the New Deal, was also part of the policy solutions of the 1930s. And we're going to frame our talk around these two issues of mitigation and adaptation where adaptation is the idea that we need to adapt our political economy to climate change, but we don't need to alter its underlying logic. And mitigation is that we need to fundamentally alter the relationships under which our capitalism operates. This was also in the New Deal, personified by these two men, these two white men, these two men, white men with power in the 1930s, so things are obviously a little different now, hopefully. But Jesse Jones on the top there, he's the guy hanging over the shoulders of those two other guys, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. He was a banker from Texas. He was an investor, a publisher. He was a quintessential capitalist. He believed in the power of capital to alter the world around him in the way that Texans believe that the world can be remade according to their will as long as you find enough loans. <laughs> on the other hand, there's Harold Ickes, Secretary of the Interior, a politician. He believes that, in fact, capitalism itself had failed, and we need to find a new way. Now, the high school history you remember um, is probably more about the Harold Ickes variety of direct spending, the building of stadiums, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the building of beautiful national parks. But there's another story of the New Deal that I'm going to also talk about tonight that is from the Jesse Jones perspective. Ickes felt capitalism had failed, and that's what the results were in the 30s, and something new had to be built atop it. Whereas Jones felt that, in fact, capitalism just needed a little love. It needed a little help in reconnecting the dynamicism of capital investment to the economy. In the 1930s, just like now, the causes of our crises 
were man-made. The solutions need to be as well. In his first inaugural address, Roosevelt told the Americans that the problems besieging the economy were not, quote, plague of locusts sent by an angry god, but the result of stubbornness and incompetence of the rulers of exchange of mankind's good. Now, what's nice about this is that since it's man-made, perhaps we can actually adapt to it. Perhaps we can mitigate it. Perhaps we can engage with it through the very mechanisms through which we cause this crisis to occur, or hopefully invent new solutions. But these conditions, which Roosevelt warned had come very close to destroying modern civilization, are once again upon us. And we hope to use this as an analogy to begin to think through how to talk about these two very scary, very important, very pressing issues that are facing us today. So as we think about this analogy, we thought it would be helpful to review what happened at the Dust Bowl and how it came to uh, enter the political conversations about what to do during the New Deal. So on May 9th, 1934, a few winds started blowing in the North Dakotas, and within two days, a huge wall of earth, some 2,000 miles wide, barreled toward New York and Washington. The cities on the eastern seaboard were completely eclipsed. The Statue of Liberty was not visible. The storm had dropped 350 million tons of topsoil as it moved across the country. But most importantly, this storm brought the Dust Bowl, the ecological disaster in America's heartland, to Washington and New York, the centers of power and finance. Today, climate change is not always most directly felt in the centers of power and finance. So as we go through the story, we'll be bringing up some of the analogies that might be helpful. The Dust Bowl and the storms that accompanied it was truly apocalyptic. The storms were catastrophic. The dust, the, sorry, the drought uh, that <coughs> afflicted the region was equally catastrophic. Um, reporters who visited the region wrote of uh, blistered fields, dead crops, starving livestock, plagues of jackrabbits and grasshoppers. And the New York Times wrote, the cold hand of death has descended on the breadbasket of the nation. It has become a lost people living in a lost land. By the time this dust storm, just a year after the first big dust storm start, uh, hit, 850 million tons of topsoil had been lifted off the earth and transported around the country. And these storms would continue for four more years. So unlike today, where climate change is something theoretical, off in the future, this was truly catastrophic. It felt like the end of days. But the Dust Bowl was geographically separate from Washington. So here you can see where the Dust Bowl was concentrated. It was concentrated in this kind of southern heartland of the United States. And policymakers felt it intermittently. What this but the, the effect that this had was that the uh, policy solutions to an ecological disaster did not feel as pressing as policy solutions to the economic disaster afflicting the nation. But just 10 years earlier, the Dust Bowl was the Great Plains. Right? So it only took 10 years to transform this verdant area where you could see uh, herds of bison some 50 miles wide transverse this area into this massive ecological disaster. So uh, these changes can happen tremendously fast. So how did this happen? Well, essentially the Dust Bowl was a product of a speculative bubble. The government had begun parceling out the land in 1909 through an expanded Homestead Act, but people didn't really take them up on the offer right away. When wheat prices shot up to $2 a bushel during World War I, when the Turks uh, blocked the shipment of uh, wheat, uh, which direction is that? To the US, eastward, westward, I'm a little dyslexic. Um, and wheat prices shot up dramatically, people moved west. And uh, it was the new gold rush caused by these high wheat prices, 
but it was also made possible by a series of financial structures that allowed for this massive and energetic movement of people to take advantage of this. So easy credit for mortgages and tractors, and uh, most saliently also, the notion that it didn't matter that this area had no rivers, the rain would follow the plow. If you disrupted the earth, it would cause atmospheric imbalances which would cause the rain to fall. So the movement was massive, um, and uh, people came who were speculative farmers, they were called suitcase farmers, and then the wheat prices started to fall. They didn't fall dramatically at first, they fell a little bit from $2 a bushel to half that. It's pretty dramatic, but it's not catastrophic yet. Um, and people started to leave. Well, before they started to leave, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself, they started to overexploit the land. They broke up more sod, planted more wheat, and shipped the wheat uh, to the cities. In, in much the same way, we are also facing a situation where the financial structures that we have set up, the speculative structures that we have set up, may be affecting our planet in ways that we haven't yet fully understood. Drought came to this region in 1930 and belied the claim that rain would follow the plow. Um, it dried up the land. People began to not plant crops. Suitcase farmers left. The price of wheat dropped dramatically. When the winds started to blow, which they did in 1933, 33 million acres were naked, ungrassed, unplanted, and vulnerable to the winds. By 1940, 75% of Plains land lost their original topsoil. That's a loss equivalent to about a 7% decline in GDP, or the total value of the land in Oklahoma. The poor, as they always are, were hit the hardest. One third of all farms faced foreclosure. The poor were getting sick on dust pneumonia. And so much livestock was starving that the federal government launched a program to purchase and cull starving cattle. By 1930, by the, by the 1930s, the mid-1930s, a quarter of the families in the Great, Great Plains relied on aid for their basic subsistence. This is not a surprise. The poor are always hit the hardest. But the issue here that this example raises, are, are the poor um, an indicator of when our social and economic systems are not working? Are they an indicator of broader system failure? The poor left. 2.5 million people left. Those who were poorest, without resources, without land. They went westward. These are the famous pictures that Dorothy Lange took. They became our first climate change refugees in the US. So these drought refugees, as they were called at the time, became a huge cultural phenomenon. Think Steinbeck, think Dorothea Lange, much cultural production around this. But it turns out that most people actually didn't leave. They didn't leave the Dust Bowl. Um, most people moved within the Dust Bowl to places where there hadn't been as much erosion or to the cities in the Dust Bowl. But the total population decline was actually only 5%. There's also a narrative about how everyone moved to California. This was this great migration of the Okies to California. <laughs> well, many did migrate to California, but it turns out not that many more than had migrated in the previous decade. So uh, between 1930 and 1940, only 80,000 more people than had migrated in the previous decade migrated it during the Dust Bowl. So that's you know 8,000 a year. That's not a huge amount. But they migrated at a time of economic crisis. They displaced people from soup lines and jobs. And this is why there was such a strong reaction. So it, our economic systems may actually be much more fragile in times of economic crisis than otherwise. So uh, the federal government came up with a, series, with a series of ideas about how to deal with this. Most of them were national in scope. But the one idea that they did come up with for dealing with the ecological disaster in particular was very, very modest. So to deal with this cataclysmic, apocalyptical disaster, 
they decided to engineer the land back to life through the creation of the Soil Conservation Service. And in fact, there was much debate about whether this was even necessary. And Hugh Bennett, who became the leader, the director of the, the Soil Conservation Service, was asked, should, should we even bother? And it turned out that day there was a dust storm that had blown in from the Dust Bowl. And he said, well, sirs, look outside your window. The rehabilitation of the land was very uh, standard, not very imaginative. Things like terraces, drainage, plowing techniques, the planting of trees, saplings which died within the year, and grasses. And the, making the rehabilitation of soil contingent on receiving state aid so you deal with any kind of collective action problem that there had been. This program was modestly successful. It was modestly su successful at achieving its goal, which was to make sure that people could stay where they were and continue to plant wheat by breaking up, by, by exploiting the soil in, in a way that the soil could not handle. So fast forward, right? So it turns out that we are actually following that same trajectory. And the Dust Bowl is an area where the uh, technical engineering of agriculture has expanded and deepened through agribusiness. And agribusiness not only grows wheat, but it grows a, a many other thirsty crops. And it does so by drawing on an underground aquifer uh, called the Ogallala Aquifer, 30% of which has been drained within 50 years. And the prediction is that within 50 additional years, we're likely not to have any water at all. So uh, the equivalent of one lake mead is drawn up every year. And in some places, the water is already gone. So it would take 6,000 years to replenish this aquifer. And in fact, more energy in the form of soil fertilizer goes into the ground than comes out through food. And there is an economic system through federal subsidies and uh, the organization of agribusiness that supports this kind of agriculture. And as the aquifer declines, we're beginning to see some of the same kind of desperate intensification strategies that we saw by farmers during the, during the Dust Bowl, um, trying to figure out how to draw up more water, drill deeper, um, plant wider. But uh, the Dust Bowl has re-emerged as a Dust Bowl. The Great Plains have re-emerged as a Dust Bowl. Um, they've been hit by drought since 2012. And Many old timers who lived through the first series of droughts and storms uh, claim that it looks just like the beginnings of the Dust Bowl that they lived through. And that's the story of intensification. But what is the story of innovation in the New Deal? What is the story of not just the uh, misallocation of capital, but proactive, innovative allocation of capital? So the economic policies of the New Deal did not directly address the Dust Bowl but it helped the people who were set in motion, the migrants, the displaced, begin to adapt to their new lives. We see pictures here of the so-called Hoovervilles. Um, these, these were the shanty towns that were visible in most cities. This one's flooded out in California. These weren't unique. About 300,000 migrants came to California, even though that was not substantially more than would have come in the previous decade as well. But this issue of all these people, like today, was framed as an excess of people, an excess of labor. There's too many people. There's not enough jobs. But it wasn't just in the early 1930s a question of too many people or excess labor, but a question of excess capital. Today, if you look at our own banks, how much capital is there above what is required by law? The answer is $2.3 trillion in excess of what is required to meet reserve requirements. That's about two-thirds of the federal budget. I'll come back to this number in a little while. But I think we should recognize that if there is $2.3 trillion just sitting in a bank, probably it is not being well used. That probably this capital ought to be invested somewhere else. And this right here is where capitalism fails. This is not a question of Uber or even of robots, but the failure of capital to be invested in innovative new industries that provide millions of jobs. And this problem is not unique to us today. It was also a problem in the Great Depression. More than any graph, you can look at this letter, which is a letter between the head of Citibank, then National City, and the head of Bank of America, 
where they talked about how it was, quote, impossible to find any use of money. They did not know where to invest their capital. The smartest bankers in the country were unable to find a place to invest their capital productively. The New Deal was not just the story of Harold Ickes and statist spending. The New Deal was also a moment where there was a reinvention of how capital could be stimulated to move through the economy, to restart the economy. How do you get the private capital, and now I'm making the film guys nervous, how do you get the private capital that's over here onto the garden to foster recovery? This is an image from the 1930s. And I want you to notice how nervous Uncle Sam looks, how Uncle Sam is in fact standing on the hose, but only Uncle Sam has the nozzle. And this is ba the basic question of the 1930s. How do you get private capital back in circulation so that there is a widespread recovery? The way they did it then, and we can get wonkish in the Q&A if you want, um, but basically how this private capital at Bank of America, Citibank, and our largest insurance companies got filtered through federal market-making mechanisms, like the Federal Housing Administration, which provide houses, the REA, which provide electricity to um, all rural America, and the Defense Plant Corporation, which we'll talk back to in a second. Now, what's interesting about this is there wasn't one single silver bullet. There was a multiplicity of approaches. So the capital went to local banks and finance companies, capital went to local electrical cooperatives, and capital went to big business. And through this, you can see a variety of different sectors of the economy that receive stimulation. And so aerospace, which I'm going to talk about now, um, was but one of many different areas through which this idle capital got put in motion again through the activities of men and women like Jesse Jones. And why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? Well, how do you get someone to invest in something that seems impossible? In retrospect, the aerospace industry seems like an obvious thing to put money into. It's, well, of course, it's really bad for oil consumption, but it's really great to get around. And of course, so how do you do this? How do we get money into something that seems cutting edge and impossible? Now, in like green energy. So in the 1930s, the airplane remained an oddity. The Depression was closer to Lindbergh, Lindbergh's famous flight over the Atlantic um, than uh, the Ansari X Prize is to us today. Lindbergh flew the Atlantic in 1927. And so you should think about the relationship between the New Deal and um, the aerospace industry like we think about space planes today. Now, maybe in Silicon Valley, they're like, oh yeah, that works fine. But everywhere else, that seems crazy, okay? Nobody thinks they're actually gonna ride a space plane anywhere, ever. <laughs> this is how aerospace was conceived. To put it in perspective, um, in 1939, I mean, you might think, aerospace was big in the 30s. I've watched Indiana Jones. He rode in a plane. The thing is, it was more like a garage industry. More Americans in 1939 worked in candy manufacturing than worked in aerospace. So how do you do this? How does you go from something that's less important than candy to being the main driver of the entire economy in about five years? The answer, it was done through the Defense Plant Corporation. Defense Plant Corporation, using the legitimation of war, but really it was about just allocating capital, takes all this money from the banks and insurance companies and puts it into the aerospace industry. In just the course of a few years, the aircraft capacity was expanded by 4,000%. By the end of the war, it was four times larger than the pre-war, the largest industry of the pre-war, which was the car industry. It also transformed where manufacturing was happening. So if pre-war manufacturing centers were New York City or Detroit, during, this, during the war, manufacturing moved into exactly those regions, like um, Fort Worth and Kansas City and Tulsa and Omaha, they were hardest hit by the Dust Bowl. It's in those places that new factories were built, new jobs were created. And so what does this mean? It means that this is a, a mechanism by which entirely new, innovative, cutting edge, crazy technologies can provide jobs to millions of people throughout the country. By the end of the war, 40% of the Los Angeles workforce, about 2.1 million people, 
ended up working for airplane companies. Where did the Okies go to work? They went to go work for Curtis Wright. This is made possible by capital, capital that was not being provided by private means, but was instead filtered through um, the Defense Plant Corporation. This is the different companies. These are all well-known companies now. You can see the varieties of different amounts of financing that came through the Defense Plant Corporation, which was a part of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Now, we've talked about aerospace. Let's talk about aluminum. Aluminum today is considered you know, a commodity, a really cheap commodity, something that's so cheap we can line our streets with it. Yet, in the late 19th century, it was more expensive than gold. And part of what the DPC did was that it transformed the aluminum industry from something that was an expensive, hard to get metal into something that was so cheap, we use it to just every day in all our products. When we think about how to move from expensive, dangerous, dirty oil towards green energy, this is a model we should be considering. Do we have the money for it though? It seems like that would cost a lot. Well, if you convert all the money from this exact moment, the reconstruction um, from the DPC, you add up everything that it provided from an aerospace industry to the aluminum industry, synthetic rubber, all these other things, it's $95 billion. Which sounds like a lot of money until you compare it with the $2.3 trillion that's just sitting there idle in the banks right now. This is an example of how you could adapt to these changes. How do we adapt these models of the past, adapt these innovative ways, creative in ways of investing capital to the climate change challenge of today, to the challenge of the future of work today, where jobs and tasks are being replaced because it is easy um, to replace them with technologies we have. Humans are best suited for jobs that don't exist yet. Roosevelt had a portfolio mindset. He knew that some things would fail. He knew that other things would succeed. Instead of, having, instead of having a consistent ideology about where to put money when and hoping that one particular thing would work out, he had unleashed a variety of different approaches. And this is something we need to do as we move forward trying to handle climate change. All right, so now we just want to fast forward to the present, bring us back to the moment, and look at climate change as it's manifesting today. So we're not going to go into a whole prognosis of what's going to happen. That's beyond our scope and actually would take many days. What we just want to flag here is if you just take one prediction, so sea level rise, and you map that onto economic change and economic production, it turns out to raise alarm bells that cause us to really think about the necessity for exploring solutions of adaptation and mitigation. So these are the areas of the US that are very vulnerable to sea level rise and to the extreme climactic events that accompany that. So major storms and with them storm surges and flooding and seawater intrusion, et cetera, and so forth. These are the areas of our country where the economy is most productive. You'll notice that there's a co-location here, that they map almost perfectly on one another. This is the place where we're betting on our future. This is where venture capital is investing. This is where we see our future emerging. If you notice, there seems to be an overlap. Okay. Unlike during the Dust Bowl, I mean, in some way, the, the catastrophic, very painful, cataclysmic climate event that happened, ecological disaster that happened in the Dust Bowl with the climate event of the drought was a godsend. It moved labor from small-scale agriculture to the industries that needed them. And so the, this act of God protected the federal government for having to, from having to do it basically by force or through other policy means. It was fortuitous. But if you look at where our future lies, or at least where we think it lies, we, any kind of climactic event that affects those areas is not likely to have the same kind of salutatory thank you, effect. Um, if we just think, if, you, if we just look at two centers that we think of as places of innovation, financial innovation, technological innovation, we can see that those centers with a one meter rise are likely to be highly affected. Right? The, 
The thing to note here is that this one meter rise, the projection from, for when it is likely to occur, moves closer and closer as each scientific study emerges. So a year ago, we thought this would happen in a century. Now we are worried that it may happen within 30 to 40 years, the life of a mortgage. Right? If you are in New York, you might think, OK, that doesn't look terrible. You know, maybe the, no more people from New Jersey. They can't cross the bridge. Maybe that's not so bad. But if you are Google, you should be asking yourself why you're building your headquarters where in 30 years it will be flooded. If you're Facebook, you should be asking yourself why you um, are investing in locating your offices here. At CASBIS, we're li likely to be fine. We're up on the <laughs> Keep investing in CASBIS. This is the <laughs> takeaway. So what does this mean? What does this mean using um, thinking about the New Deal, thinking about the 1930s? These are analogies. These are not a playbook. They are experiences, warnings, beginnings of conversations, encouragements to help us think about the future to help us think about what has worked and what hasn't worked. But it doesn't define the entire space of what we can do or we definitely shouldn't do. We do know that we should avoid doing more of the same, that investment is easier than abolition of wheat farming, for instance. And we know that the poorest will be hit hardest, both in the US and abroad. We do, at the same time, know where it's been successful. The collaborative disagreement, multiplicity, inconsistent experiments, and a portfolio mindset have enabled us to think through and succeed in solving some of the most crushing economic challenges of the day. But the world is not the same as it was. There are new things in the 21st century. The biggest advantage we have, of course, is that one, we know what's coming. We know this is going to happen. We know that climate change is now inevitable. And two, we have the lessons of the past to help steer us through these shoals. Now, between the two of us, we have a slight disagreement. We agree in our values. We agree what's going to happen about how to respond to this. And this is not something to be avoided. This is something to be acknowledged, encouraged, and fostered. Because it's only through this collaborative disagreement that we can really get through these crises. I, for instance, think that it's very important to creatively finance new technologies, new work practices that will help us mitigate climate change. I think we can remake capitalism to be, more gre to be greener, to be more profitable, and more ethical. I think that we can move from oil to, pho to artificial pho photosynthesis. I think we can move from consolidated, centralized, stable workplaces to distributed workplaces. And I think this because I know it has happened before. I think that to be practical, we should confine our solution space within the rule set of capitalism. But at the same time, I think that rule set of capitalism can be wildly altered. I can think back to the 19th century, where we radically reconfigured capitalism towards more moral and more profitable ends. Of course, I'm thinking about the end of slavery. In the, the mid-19th century, about half of our GDP was related to the production of, the consumption of, or the distribution of slaves and slave-related commodities, including the mortgaging of enslaved peoples. Did we end slavery? We did. Did it destroy capitalism? No. In fact, it did the opposite. We took something that was half our economy and we reoriented towards a new kind of capitalism that was more profitable, more innovative than anything that had happened before. This is how we should be reframing our thinking about the challenges to our economy. This isn't about costs. This is about opportunity. So um, in thinking about climate change, there's a lot of discussion about technological innovation, technological opportunity. And while I think this kind of adaptation is very important and necessary, I don't think it's sufficient. So uh, Google cars have become kind of an avatar for the future. They're very exciting. They're self-driving. Um, but actually, what will make matter more for climate change is uh, a fundamental rethinking of how we move through space. Google cars use the same highways, the same infrastructure, and the same concept about moving through space. Um, what we may need to start thinking about are things like zoning, redesigning our transport systems, 
rethinking about, uh, rethinking our relationship to space and how we move through it. And in fact, so I'm picking on Google here a little bit, but Google is actually thinking about that a lot through their alphabet outfit. They're thinking, about, they have a lab called Sidewalk Labs. But the trouble with zoning is it's not sexy. So why is zoning not sexy? Okay, we have certain ideas about where the fields of possible action are during the New Deal. They were very, very heavily focused on finance and agriculture, well, less so on agriculture, as we've shown. And another way of thinking about these are institutions and land use. Right? So institutions are essentially how we interact with each other, how we deal with each other. And land use is how we deal with the land, how we use the land for our productive purposes. But as we conceptualize these, um, we always view the earth as unchanging. It is a constant. It's a background. It does not change unless we change it by plowing up the earth and hoping that the rain will follow. Or today's analogy by seeding the clouds to hope that the rain will fall on California. Planning, though, becomes very sexy if you imagine the earth constantly changing under your feet. If you imagine that what we understand to be stable is no longer so, that these are new problems, new challenges, and new systems, we have to build new systems of flexibility. And, it, and thinking about planning in that way forces us to rethink how we might think about how we interact with each other through institutions if we were worried about the earth changing in unpredictable, unknowable ways, and how we interact with the earth if it is also changing and evolving in unpredictable and often very, very fast ways. The trouble is, that the, and the big challenge for making fundamental change, is that the people who worry about climate change don't talk to the people who worry about changing production systems and the future of work. In both spheres, there's an understanding that we're at an inflection point, that things going forward are likely to look very different from the way they have looked in the past. But these discussions have remained separate. And our, and our intention with this talk was to bring them together. Okay. What we'd like to see, and which I think is extremely important, is that climate scientists help inform discussion about how production is likely to be impacted by climate change. How will our transport routes be affected? How will our global supply chains fall apart? How will manufacturing happen if we can't bring steel to firms? How will you build the plane? <laughs> right? And what we'd like to have is people who worry about changing production systems have conversations with client, climate scientists so that they can productively think about how to adapt and mitigate even as they produce. Um, and Bringing these areas together raises a whole series of new, unasked questions and experiments, some of which may seem kind of fantastical, like how do we move Silicon Valley? This is not a trivial question. If Silicon Valley gets flooded, how do we move the networks, the capital, the knowledge economy that has been so embedded and that we've been unable to replicate, even though cities and countries around the world have tried to replicate it? How do we move it when it's flooded? That's 30 years down the road and a whole series of questions. And some of these questions are questions that we are asking here through the Future of Work and Workers Project at CASBIS. And we are in particular worried about how do we treat each other as the climate and the economy change? What is a new moral economy for a changing world? Okay. So Lewis and I highlighted our differences. And actually, it may be just a difference in focus or approach. If you're worried about adaptation, it seems that the solutions may be easier to come by. There is data, there are clear price signals, and there are institutional pathways and historic examples of reform that make it seem possible and doable and lessons that we can draw on. If you're worried about mitigation, it's a whole different ballgame because we don't understand the systems that are changing. Our understanding of them is profoundly incomplete, changes by the day. And so we have to uh, act in a setting that is highly uh, incohate. And yet, we have to act now. Otherwise, our actions are likely not to have any effect at all. And we have to act, I would argue, in ways that are profound, um, in ways that would actually look like a revolution in the institutional structures that we rely on, the revolution in our relationship to land. And he, by, he, here, I'm not using 
revolution in, in a Bernie kind of way. What, I, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to reconceptualize our notion that the earth and the resources that it generates are here for our productive use only. Um, although these are different approaches, we uh, think that they offer possibilities. And here I'll just mention the possibilities. Do you want to say anything about this? or? Um. No, I think that the, the important thing is that we have to act, and we have to act quickly, and that we have to act in multiple ways, and realize that the future will not be stable. The future will be a rewriting of the world in a constantly changing way. And that as we move forward, the future of work must help us address these issues. The conversations we have have to be brought together if we're going to mitigate and adapt, if we're going to survive as a species and as a planet. And the analogies of the 1930s are not perfect, we hope it's a starting point for beginning to think through what are the policies we can do to invent the industries of the future, to invent a way of handling this ongoing and almost inevitable crisis. And to face the constraints. And to face the constraints. And the unknowable. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. That was a fantastic talk, um, and it was very, the Work and Workers group has been dealing with many of these issues, but this brought together a whole new aspect to it, even though we've talked about climate change and environmental problems that could enhance um, both the kinds of economic complexities that we face, but also what the future of Work and Workers will be. We hadn't really laid out that agenda quite so clearly as the two of you did tonight. And I'm very grateful for that because it really helps us. And I think everybody in the room who's part of our group and hopefully others of you will see this as a way in which we might begin to think as we go forward. Um, are there some questions? I'm sure there are comments that you want to raise. OK, Christy, you, take, you send the first one. Will you introduce yourself? Hi, thank you. I'm Martha Russell, uh, Media X at Stanford University. I love the talk. Bringing disciplines together in this way is so exciting. It's what CASPS does. And I do have this question, though. You talked about a lot of things that we know, and it's important to you know, put those stakes in the ground. But looking at the future that you paint, what would you say are the most important things that we need to know that we don't now know that would help us create this future that we want to live in? I was going to collect a couple questions, but that one's too hard to pass up. I think you have to take it right away. Well, I think the challenge is that we don't really know what we need to know. Right? This is like a, an impossible problem. It's a wicked problem. Um, we do know that things that we have considered stable are no longer such, and that they are likely to pr present us with challenges that are unpredictable and unlike anything we've ever seen. So, just to give you an example, um, basically most, much of our economy relies on shipping containers, moving products around the world. And one can imagine that storms, major climactic storm events, would make that difficult. Right? So uh, one piece of data that we came across was that for, the, for a cup of coffee, that's 30,000 miles of transport. So what we'd like to, well, I think the answer to that question is what are our sensitivities, what are the places where we are most vulnerable as an economic system, since we can't predict what the climate will do. We're trying very hard, but we're not there yet. What, where, where is our economic system most vulnerable, and who is most vulnerable? And where will we see the vulnerabilities emerge? What will be, who will be the canary in the coal mine? What will be the canary in the coal mine? I think, well, um when we do our financial models, we often like to run regressions and hold everything else constant. Yeah, I like numbers too. Numbers are very reassuring. And numbers may or may not have anything to do with how we're going. That there'll be <laughs> wild discontinuities for the good and for the bad. I mean, that's the essential truth about capitalism, that it's a discontinuity with all of human history. Something that's only been around a few hundred years and has produced unimaginable amounts of wealth and also unimaginable amounts of inequality. So what we need to think about is how do we turn that engine into something that works for us rather than just works us over. And thinking through this in relation to climate change, you have to think about those things simultaneously. You can't just hold 
everything else constant. There was a question. Why don't Hi, my name is Edward Strickland. I'm the CEO of a business named GBiz Incorporated, and we're a member of the Stanford Center of Professional Development. In regards to the timing of the change, there's some systemic issues that are occurring today that didn't happen in the early 1900s, and that's the population growth. It's tenfold, and the demand on the industrialized, capitalized model is that much greater now than it ever has been before. And the problems that we're facing today from that in regards to land grabs throughout the world for the oceans, the food, the land that's sustainable to be used is even more grave than it ever has been. How do we calculate the change? Because if you say there's an, in an inflection point that needs to make this change occur, it cannot be gradual. It has to be bifurcated and there has to be some radical revolution otherwise we won't change. Can that be addressed? Thank you. I did get them to uh, not include demography as well in this already complicated. We were told to have a half hour. And as you can see, we really <laughs> held to that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a very important point. Do you want to collect questions and then? Yeah, why don't we collect okay. a couple questions? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mark Bregman, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at NetApp, a tech company here. Um, it strikes me that there's one difference here, and maybe there isn't because I just don't know the history, but we're in a situation where there's a lot of prediction of climate change, and there are many people who don't believe the predictions. The photographs you showed from the 1930s, that's not a prediction. There's a wall of dirt coming across the country. And, and I don't know whether there was a precursor to that of prediction of disaster um, that was ignored. But in our case, uh, I mean, there's a politically different challenge, and it's a little bit related to the earlier question, you almost need to have an actual cataclysmic event, it appears, as we did in the 30s, to bring people to action. It's, it's wonderful to think about this, and I think in this, in this audience, you get lots of people sympathetic, but to actually move the population, how do we do that? How do we bring that about? Or do we sit here and in five years say, we told you so? Why don't we take one more question? Is there one in the back? Just to, I'll, I'll come to you next, Bob. I promise. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my name's Randy Spock. Uh, I'm a student at the business school down the road, and uh, I can't speak on behalf of my fellow future capitalist cronies, but I personally am very receptive to the arguments both for adaptation and mitigation. My question is, how can we help? How can those of us who are not scrutinizing these institutions from without, but who hope to be embedded in them from within, how can we contribute to this ongoing quest? Okay, so we've got three questions. One has to do with the, the importance of population shifts. The second has to do with how do we get the public to understand what's going on. And the third comes from the next generation, how can we help? Well, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> try to pull a couple things together here. Um, I think some people already know this is happening, especially people who live in coastal areas, especially in the developing world. Um, climate change is already real. Um, climate change is not as real to us, but in many parts of the world it already is. And those emerging economies where we, if you look to studies, we're counting on for the continued growth of capitalism, global capitalism in the 21st century. If you look to how we value all our stocks, it's through this, these emerging markets. Yet these emerging markets are the ones that are most vulnerable to these new kinds of developments. So it, one of the challenges is how do we think about this not just in a national context, but a global context, where we come up against very real governance issues. Um, and we'll have to think through how to deal with that. Um, how, what can be done? I mean, if the answer is that these governance issues are such a barrier, how do we mitigate those governance issues in a libertarian way? Or how do we move together and bring together different constituencies in a more uh, statist way? Um, I think that it would be lovely if um, capitalists of the future could figure out how to make money off um, saving the world. I mean, that would be the ideal situation. Um, but I suspect that people who have these ideas don't have the capital to get going. And that we, through a series of policies, have choked off access to innovators and small businesses that need that capital. Um, it's hard, if you're outside of very sexy short-term profits, to get long-term investment. And so we need to do something to mitigate that risk for investors, like we did in the 1930s, to get these new kinds of industries going.
Can I say a few things? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think Lewis is actually right on the money with this. Uh, there's something about. We usually agree, by the way. So this is the. Yeah, this is <laughs> we're drawing out an artificial right. contrast. I think I would place the emphasis slightly differently. Um, which is that the rigidities uh, in terms of how we value successful investment, uh, in many ways we transplant those onto emerging economies, um, those rigidities are mirrored by policy rigidities. So if we were going to think about what to do, one easy prescription would be do no harm. So for example, in many of our trade agreements, we have stipulations that make it incredibly difficult for local and national governments to adjust and to respond quickly and effectively to climate change pressures. We may want to think about that as we draft trade agreements and maybe not include those stipulations, not only to allow countries to respond, but also because that knowledge of how to respond uh, will provide us with guidance of how to move forward. Um, the question about, did, did people know that the Dust Bowl was going to happen? Um, some people did. And the trouble is that the people who did were not the people whose knowledge was valued. Mm -hmm. So there's a politics of knowledge even then, right? So the Native Americans who were displaced from the Great Plains uh, were famously expert in managing the, this, these huge bison herds and got their livelihood from it and warned, even as they were chased off the land and as the last bison was killed, that this would destroy the earth. Cattle ranchers who came in after them gave the same warning, but they were not included in this speculative financial bubble that drove so many small farmers to the Midwest. And finally, the question about population. Pretty much everywhere you look in the world, we're on the other side of the population bubble. We're on the other side of the population hump. Um, by that I mean our populations pretty much everywhere in the world are going to start declining. The challenge, the bigger challenge is that we, and we know how to manage that. The bigger challenge is that we don't know how to manage the movement of populations. And so Syria, for example, is just a warm up. Right? Syria is the, the, the Syrian conflict uh, was the product uh, initially of a drought that caused people to move to cities that lit the match on a political conflict. And, and, and now we have these large refugee movements, but they're actually much like in the Dust Bowl, objectively not that large. We just don't have the political and policy capacity to deal with them. And so the question is, how do we develop that capacity? Because this will be a, a, a structural issue, and we will need to think about how to organize our production systems to accommodate the structural flow of people who have left in uh, a rapid, not gradual, not planned way. I just want to add one thing to, to what, where the canary in the mine is and reinforce the point that often indigenous peoples have been moved to the absolute margins of viable land and water resources and are a very good way to know when, what's happening. They know when everything's disappearing. I, I just also want to say that there's never excess people. There's insufficient opportunities. People are amazing and people um, are more creative than we give them credit for. And we need to figure out ways to harness that and not put people either in, into roles where they can't be creative and be human. And that part of uh, the task of addressing these issues is really capturing the global creativity of the human race. OK, I promise the Bob Kaplan, who's not my husband, the next question, though. <laughs> Bud, was it you? You're not the Bob Kaplan. Not my husband, more the <laughs> <laughs> okay. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bud Conrad. His last 10 years, uh, chief economist for investment, a uh, small boutique firm. And I think you've underestimated in this analysis, although I love the integration of two very different fields so well, and including some divisive uh, discussion about technology solutions or revolutionary solutions. I think we're headed towards revolution. Um, personally, because I don't see that it will evolve. The problems I see, particularly the financial ones and the political ones, which are closely intertwined with our bought and paid for government, means that we're going to likely have political revolution that is going to precede perhaps the biological, econo uh, 
environmental revolution, and I consider it perhaps fairly soon. So my question is, how do you see that fourth, third, I'm not sure which, additional introduction, because I consider both politics and economics very vulnerable in our country to revolution in the future. And I certainly wouldn't use the name mitigation for that. I'd say revolution is its own name, and maybe a third uh, prong for your stool. Thank you, bud. Well, as, as a guy with spectacles who spends his days reading, um, I prefer there not to be a revolution. And yeah, yeah, as are you. Um, I think this is one of the reasons that the New Deal policies were so expansive, though, that there was this genuine fear of the organization of people in revolt. I mean, the Russian Revolution was what? A decade and a half earlier? It was still very real. Um, so I think um, maybe when these crises come together, we'll finally be able to push the political economy in a new way like we have in the past to be more equitable to produce a... This is where we disagree, right? Because if we don't act now, we are done for, right? So uh, any kind of natural resource that we're thinking about managing, any kind of hope for um, really survival on this earth, unless we actively engage with the processes of thinking about developing a new productive relationship to the earth at a time when the earth will no longer be constant. I mean, if you just take water, for example, we think about our water resources as being pretty stable, but they're not. And they're stressing our productive systems and our political systems in ways that are extreme. And so California has had a mild expression of this, but other parts of the world have had much more extreme expressions of this and have seen significant political unrest as a result. And yet we don't tend to worry about it as being immediate. But when the crisis is here, here the game is over. And as one colleague uh, said in a talk that he gave here, extinction is permanent. <laughs> so, Lewis, um, as a historian, I know that you... We have time for just two more questions. So okay. we'll take yours and Flynn's. And then we'll take a break. <laughs> so, Lewis, as a historian, I know that you think in long cycles, but the rest of us are not very good about that. You know, us CASBIS fellows uh, um, think about what's for lunch tomorrow, what's <laughs> concerned about next week. Um, and in fact, we know that we apply huge discounts to the future, and it may be even worse for our policymakers, members of the House who are very concerned about what's happening now and not very concerned about what happens two years from now. How do, how do you take that into consideration? Yeah, oh, okay, you take it, actually. I'm Glenn Lowry, I'm a fellow here at CASPIS, I teach at Brown University. Okay, so my question is, we've got a historian of capitalism and we've got a student of human migration. Would you comment on the observation that where we see people moving on the planet, they're moving toward, not away from, capitalism? Hi, uh, Everett Harper, I'm the CEO of Trust, a uh, software infrastructure company um, and a distributed company. So <clears throat> I was very uh, uh, interested in how uh, Future of Work and uh, our company intersect, which is why I'm here. Um, the, the three things that you talked about that, re with, that freed a lot of unused capital. One, you talked about slavery. The second you talked about was, uh, was World War II in aerospace. And I had a talk, I went to a talk um, with Neil deGrasse Tyson a little while ago, and he talked about uh, the space program being fueled by the Cold War. And so what I was wondering about is, has there been an example where there's been tremendous capital infusions of that size that did not involve war? And then second, is there, does that, does that predict anything for you about how capital will move in the future of that, of that scale? Thank you. Um, Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll answer in reverse order. So one of the debates we had, I think it's an excellent question, was um, I advocated that we frame this as war, war against the planet, um, that the planet wants to kill us and we should frame it as war because people seem to like war um, for whatever reason. Um, rather than we are defending the earth, we are attacking the earth. Um, there, I mean, I think this is a way in which we need to think about how we frame this problem so that the enemy is upon us, right? I was thinking about how America got whipped into this wartime frenzy during World War I against the Huns, right? Just sort of the faceless Huns who wanted to come and kill us. Germany had no interest uh, in attacking. This is before Germany's were Nazis, when they were just, you know, 
Germans. Um, so they were just, you know, just one of many, many imperial powers. Um, so this is one of the questions we should think about, right? How do we frame this question to really get people as excited about saving the earth and ourselves as we are about killing other people? And I think this is an important question. Um, were there places where it wasn't wartime industry? I mean, you think of the largest flows of capital, right? You think of um, factories in the 19th century. Um, the textile factories were a war against Africans who were enslaved in some place. Um, you think about railroads. That was about the wars against the Indians in a lot of ways. I mean, there's always these things which are partially about war, but partially about other issues. Um, and so there's a pretext of war for capital investment that um, I, I think it'd be nice if we could invest in things that weren't about war. So that if we could have a NASA without having to uh, think about how to fight the Russians at the same time. Um, and of course, there's a lot of it. So this is a larger conversation we should have about how do we get people motivated without trying to kill people. Um, Glenn's question, um, so what, what is, why are people moving towards capital? Capitalism where the job is. So I think the question is how do we create a capitalism that can absorb all these people? Um, and remember that the passport is only a little over a century old. How do we absorb all these migrations of people around the world and make capitalism more inclusive? Um, and in terms of long cycles, it's true. I'm less alarmist, perhaps, than, or, or less alarmed than my colleagues, probably, because I think, well, we've seen all kinds of inequities before. They've been rebalanced, and there's more inequities. It's been rebalanced. Um, I can think about 1877 and the railroads and how you know, there were widespread strikes against the inequities of capitalism that led to parts of Pennsylvania being reconquered by Gatling guns on the backs of railroad cars. So is that a possibility? I hope not. I mean, people, lots of people died. Um, so I think one of the questions is, is this time different? And we talk about that question a lot. We talk about the future of work. Is this different? Is this second machine age going to actually not be able to absorb all these people? And the, and the, the real question you should be asking is, is this a climatic shift? actually different? Is this more like an ice age than just you know, a slight change? And how do we adapt to those questions? Curious what Natasha thinks. So I, I would say that, yes, it is like, an, I mean, certainly the best understanding of what we're happening, of what is happening now, suggests that this is a different scale in terms of the kinds of change that we're likely to see. And if we want to draw on historical examples, we might look at the Mayas, for example or Mesopotamia, or other collapse of civilizations that have not managed their natural resources well. And in those civilizations, just like in, in some of the stressors that we're seeing now, the poor suffered most, and uh, were hit first, and were hit hardest. Um, so yeah, I, I really do think that this may be a paradigm shift in terms of our understanding. In all of those historical moments, we take the Earth as a constant. The failure is institutional. It's not the Earth changing. The ground beneath our feet literally shifting. To Glenn's point, so I think migration is great. Um, and I think, I, think, I think that it's great as someone who worries about economies. And uh, uh, you know, it, with the exception of one or two economists, um, Basically, there's a consensus that uh, migration is uh, helpful for economic growth. Um, the trouble is not the people. Right? And before, before I mention that, I would just say that um, they're a barometer, just like, the, like, like we are arguing the poor, maybe, um, or the vulnerable, maybe. Um, the fact that more Mexicans are leaving than are arriving should, be, should tell us something about the futures that, that middle class and lower middle class workers have in the US. The prospects are not good, and there's no point in staying or coming. The trouble is not uh, the movement of people. The trouble is the strain that they put on the institutions that we have. And our institutions are, so, uh, are, are not designed to deal with, uh, today, are not designed to deal with massive influxes of people. In the past, they have been more flexible. And they have grown in the US and around the world increasingly more rigid. And I don't think it's accidental that we're also engaged in a system of labor arbitrage through our global supply chains in ways that are much more pervasive and systemic than they may have been before. Um, and the point about war, right? So Lewis's campaign makes me deeply, deeply nervous and deeply, deeply unsettled. <laughs> it's a thought experiment. We're at Kaz. Right? Like, yeah, okay. I'm just. But that thought experiment makes me deeply uneasy. And the reason it makes me deeply uneasy 
is that it requires us to draw on the same paradigms that have created the damage to solve the problem. And that paradigm is us against the earth. And what I'm suggesting is that we need a paradigm shift and the production of institutions um, and practices that embody that shift. So how do we think about um, structuring our governments, our laws, our international agreements, our international trade, our international finance in ways that embody an ethos around um, working with this changing and stressed earth. And just to close, what does this mean for the future of work? And also, I, I just want to say <laughs> that, that I agree with Natasha that that would be lovely. And I guess I'm just a little more pessimistic about the possibility for that kind of institutional change. And that so what I'm trying to think through is what are the most powerful levers we have to create this new change. And you know, I think we both agree it'd be lovely to do something else. Um, and if you guys have ideas about how to do this, I'm just afraid, I'm, I'm deeply afraid that we won't be able to do that. And so war and capitalism seems like something people like. Well, but right, there are hard constraints. I, I mean, the, you know, in California, right, so there are lots of debates about water rationing. There was a water shortage even before this massive drought. People say, oh, it's not politically possible. We can, there's no way we can ration water, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a massive drought. And then water is rationed because you can't invent water. And so I think that these kind of constraints, I mean, we may not want to deal with them until they're upon us. But once they're upon us, we're stuck. And better to have more options when we're stuck than fewer. With that note, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to thank both of our speakers for fa fabulous presentation of very disturbing material. <laughs> And I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>